Uh, good Monday morning, everybody. Welcome to Squawk in the Street. I'm Carl Quintanilla with Leslie Picker and John Ford. David Faber has the morning off. Bit of a split picture here this morning as we see some things working like materials and semis, but banks not getting a lot of love today. Our roadmap begins with a 4,000% return in Q1. The hedge fund manager who pulled it off is going to join us next. Then the post office in peril, an explanation of the Postal Service crisis. And later, to return or not to, the Seattle school superintendent weighs in on whether kids should learn in person this fall. If you picked the winning number at the roulette table, your payout of 35 to 1 would still be lower than the 40x returns of our first guest today. He saw 4,000% gains in Q1 during the pandemic induced volatility thanks to his tel risk hedging strategy, which acts sort of like insurance for doomsday markets. Mark Spitznagel, founder and chief investment officer of Universal Invest Investments, joins us now uh, exclusively. Mark, so thrilled to have you with us today, especially because. Uh, trading in the S&P 500 just surpassed the closing record high that we saw in February. So I'm curious, uh, you know, does the current environment make it better to be in uh, tail risk hedging or, or less productive for a portfolio? Uh, and to that effect, how are you positioned to capitalize right now? Well, I mean, you have to think about what the alternatives are in terms of risk mitigation. I mean, Universa First, is first and foremost a risk mitigation strategy. So no, this environment is, you know, <laughs> is very much our environment. I mean, we, we are in a boom and bust cycle, an epic monumental boom bust cycle. And, and uh, this is really what um, a strategy like Universes is, is here for. So you're saying that being, uh, you know, trading around those record highs, uh, surpassing those record closing highs, uh, indicates to you that we are on the cusp of another bust? I mean, I'm not necessarily saying we have to be on the cusp. Timing these things um, certainly is, is impossible. But look, um, stock market crashes happen as a direct result of overvaluation. Um, I don't think there are many people around mm. right now that would argue against the fact that markets are quite overvalued. Maybe they'll get more overvalued. I think that's the argument for being long today is they could continue to overvaluation and get even more so. But they're overvalued, and this, this, is, this is the setup for um, left tail events uh, uh, in stock markets. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, tail risk hedging because I think it's something that maybe not everyone in our audience fully understands. And and after uh, you know Universa received some press over its 4,000 plus returns in Q1, maybe it's a bit of jealousy, a bit of regret, but the strategy came under some criticism. Calpers, for example, uh, redeemed in January. It was reported that they lost out on uh, over a billion dollars from that decision. Uh, AQR came out with some reports uh, criticizing the strategy saying that it works, you know, maybe in the short term, like we saw in Q1 and what we saw in March, uh, but not for the long term, especially relative to the cost uh, that, at, that investors pay for that benefit. Uh, how would you address those critics um, who have, have pointed out, uh, you know, the costliness of tail risk hedging? I would generally agree with that. Tail, tail risk hedging um, in general, is is costly and it's a bad strategy. So the problem is you can't just talk about it's you can't just talk about tail risk hedging sort of as a thing, as a sort of commoditized um, um, sort of entity. Um, there, uh, you know, this is something you know that I've been doing for for 25 years, and and and, and people enter the space, and now all of a sudden it's a thing, which is nice. But um, you know, in many ways, tail hedgers are more different than they are alike. So we we got to be careful of that. But you know, what Universa does. You know, I refer to call it just another form of risk mitigation. It's risk mitigation done differently, risk mitigation done better. Um, so, you know, when you, th when you think it, look at a risk mitigation and you look at how um, it does in a scary environment or a market crash, you know, it's, if you just look at the returns in that crash period, you're, you're kind of missing the point. What's, what matters to risk mitigation, I, I agree with critics on this, is how does it do for you over the long run? Forget about just what it does for you in a crash. There's a payoff in a crash, but then what does it do for you when there's no crash? And you've got to look at the asymmetry there and the convexity there. Um, and that is, is, is really everything that matters. And, I so, think and, and so and also when you think about, go ahead. Oh, no, after you. So when you compare that to other risk mitigation strategies, they're doing that too. Diversifiers do that, or, or, or weak, weakly negatively correlated strategies try to do that too. They try to have some kind of a crash payoff, 
and something else. Maybe it's maybe maybe make a little bit when there's no crash, and maybe it's more like this. Whereas for Universa, it's more like this. We intend to make a lot in a crash, and we intend to lose a very little relative to that the rest of the time. But diversifiers maybe will lose you less in a crash and make you a little bit when there's no crash, and maybe CTAs will make you a little bit in a crash and make just a little bit. But it's that. And so you got to think about this from the perspective of the end user. How much do they expect to make in a crash? And therefore, how much of that thing do they have to have in order to protect themselves in that crash? And then, and then how much of that they have kind of determines how painful the rest of the time is. Are you underperforming the stock market in, this, in, in your diversifying, diversifying strategies, as I like to call them? Um, and so if you look over the long run, risk mitigation, the conventional way to do risk mitigation, is something that has, has systematically costed people return over time. It's costed them wealth. And Universa really exists to make this point that, that, that risk mitigation really should, effective, when effectively done, should raise the rate at which you compound capital. It, it, it should raise your wealth at the end of the day, or, or what was the point? And this flies very much in the face of, of modern finance. Right. And, you know, modern finance, um, you know, traditionally you learn that investing in things like gold, a basket of hedge funds, uh, you know, diversification uh, is a way to to uh, do risk mitigation. But as to your point, you could be uh, losing some upside, giving up some upside on that front. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on some on some macro uh, issues facing the market. There was a piece in the Wall Street Journal just yesterday looking at how uh, traders are bracing for greater than usual volatility during the remainder of the year uh, over concerns surrounding the election uh, potential for this election to be non-conventional uh, to, to drag on for a few weeks before we find results given given the pandemic I'm curious uh, is that something that you are focused on uh, and how are you positioned uh, in light of, of November I mean I really don't need to focus on these short run events you know we're always going to get that wrong everyone's always going to get that wrong this is sort of a tactical way to think about risk mitigation, and what we do is, is entirely a strategical, strategic, I should say, approach. Um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, it's right to anticipate some volatility, nonetheless. That's not, uh, you know, that, that has certainly some, some, uh, um, some good thinking behind it, and we've got a range of opportunities, uh, a range of p potential outcomes here. Although I would say that, you know, where it really matters to the markets um, in terms of monetary interventionism, I would argue that we don't qu really have too much of a, cho of a, of a, of a dis disparity in choices uh, in the coming election. You know, the current administration has been very much a cheerleader for the Fed and cheerleader for the stock market in, this, in, in, in that sense, complicit in this boom-bust cycle. So uh, I think it's pro in that sense, it probably will matter less. But certainly on the, on the tax front, uh, this, uh, this has impact to, 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 to the economy. Hey, Mark. Uh, good morning. So we've been talking a lot about tail risk hedging when it comes to risk mitigation, but I wonder what you think more broadly about what's happened to things like bonds that investors traditionally uh, have used to diversify uh, a portfolio or protect against the downside. They don't seem to offer the protection they used to in this environment. So um, what do you think is going to happen with that? Yeah, I mean, this is just a great point. This is something that people should really be thinking about. Um, rates where they are today, I think it's, it's a mistake to, to, to rely on bonds um, as a risk mitigation strategy. And at the end of the day, it is what they're there for. It's that sort of negative correlation when it's mostly needed versus uh, systematic exposure. I think that's really a great point. So people need to think about what the what the point of bonds are now is it hiding out is it you know there's such a there is this there's a sort of false choice in risk mitigation that you you either have to take all this risk or you have to take no risk and it's a dilemma you know you're you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't this is the big problem that the pensions are facing today when they have to make that hurdle and now of course bonds is the rate the the rates uh, interest rates in the market is making this even more of a dilemma so it is a bit of a false choice because of uh, because of how I describe other other alternatives